to the administration mini conf for our third presentation of this morning or evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, we have Federico, Federico um, from the USA talking to us about building Raspberry Pi supercomputers. Over to you, Federico. Thanks, everyone. So uh, we're going to try to make this as quick as possible. This is um, usually a two-part talk covering how to build computers with Raspberry Pis and then uh, also um, how to manage them. This time and this day, we're going to focus on the managing more than the building. Um, and then you can find uh, other versions online with uh, with the supercomputer part in terms of the coding. So the talk is designed for an hour. We have 20 minutes. We're going to excise uh, a few things here. Let's get going. So super brief introduction. I had the privilege of spending my entire career in uh, free and open source software. I'm the product management director for Ceph at Red Hat. Um, whoops, what happened here? Are you still seeing my screen? Hmm. Something happened with this to the slides. Interesting. You should see them again now. Uh, in product management at Red Hat. Uh, previously, I was the Ubuntu product manager at Canonical, Ubuntu server product manager at Canonical. And if you go back a decade, I was the dreaded systems management tsar at SUSE. And uh, shameless plug, I have a book on AWS system administration uh, by O'Reilly, uh, which is why you see the funny picture uh, that Julian Cash made of me at uh, OSCON. Um, we're not going to go over the products, uh, but you get an idea of the stuff that I worked on. So um, usually we play a lot with hardware. There's no liability if you follow our instructions and stop your tour, bring about the end of the world or break your device, which is the much more likely outcome. Uh, this year, mischief is a lot less likely than usual, uh, but uh, some smart Alec will doubtlessly succeed in destroying something. I know I have. I have already smoked the Pi 4 HDMI port uh, working on the stock uh, when uh, Lou's um, uh, cable touched the bare power supply. So um, let's look for a second at what, um, at what, uh, these computers look like. I have to break out uh, here. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh. Never mind. There is a problem here. We're just going to go straight into the system administration where we don't have the ability to go into the hardware the way I planned. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, these clusters usually like look like this. We have uh, a number of Raspberry Pis uh, stacked in a custom case. I tend to use the, the Pico cluster arrangement uh, because I find it convenient and uh, it's a company here in Utah that, uh, that makes them. It's relatively accessible to me, and uh, they're relatively friendly. There are a lot of kits to build uh, Raspberry Pi computers, uh, supercomputers, or clusters with, um, with Pi boards. Some of the vendors actually make other types of boards available, but uh, almost all of them uh, have Pi boards uh, for this kind of use. In the case of the Pico cluster specifically, we um, have effectively a power board that distributes uh, power through the cluster so that you have a single source of, of, um, of storage, um, I'm sorry, of uh, voltage, and an easy way to turn uh, on or off the entire thing. The thing and the part that, um, I want to focus on is that uh, there are additional things that you can do with the hardware. Um, I haven't pulled up the, the pictures here because we don't have the time to go into the into the other set. But um, besides the the boards, there are additional things that you can have. Um, uh, there is a Pi Moroni blinked array of LEDs that you can use, for example, to signal the status of the board with LEDs. 
and a few other things of that kind that you can use to accessorize your cluster. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but these options do exist. The part that's common to all clusters, however, is this uh, attempt to have centralized power management, either because you can manage to shut things up or down, or um, or so that you can control uh, clean shutdowns remotely. Now, there's a little bit of variability there, but that's a commonality across all clusters. Let's uh, jump into the software, which is uh, what we're focusing on tonight, or today for you. So um, we want to have um, a user setup that is consistent across all nodes of the cluster so that uh, your uh, process can run across all nodes transparently. So. Typically, uh, I start with the images of the Pico cluster um, uh, setup, which are basically modified Raspbian images. Uh, other users use um, Ubuntu images um, to use 64-bit code. Depending on whether you have Pi3 uh, as the board, uh, I would recommend Raspbian for those. Um, until a Raspbian 64 bits becomes stable, uh, I would recommend using uh, Ubuntu or Fedora images for, um, for uh, Pi 4 boards. So this is pretty uh, standard run-of-the-mill stuff. Um, usually, I set up things so that you have one user with your privileges, uh, with your standard privileges, and a root user mostly a backup, because this, this uh, standard user that you have is transparent pseudo, so that they can escalate the, the compute um, processes transparently. Because on these, on these images, you have to rename an existing user. That's part of the instructions here to kill XAuth and uh, the XAuth file so that um, things update transparently. Um, nothing too strange here. Um, because of the simple structure of the cluster, there is no NIS LDAP or anything of that kind, NFS access is very straightforward. Um, I like to create users with consistent UIE numbers across all nodes uh, so that you have um, uh, multiple, if you have multiple users logging into the same cluster, you are sure that there is consistency. Um, and maybe a, a good bit of insurance for when you grow up to better use of the cluster. But for single use, it may not be necessary, but you're creating these users anyway. Let's just be clean and make so that they all have the same user UID. On some clusters, I, use, I add a second privileged user pi or ops uh, to separate operations and production, um, but not on this one. And this one is simple, um, simple and straightforward. The next thing that we want to clean up while building uh, one of these uh, small um, desktop supercomputers is uh, the run levels. It makes sense to disable X on cluster nodes other than the first one. Um, the first one typically owns the HDMI interface. So if you're going to use video, it makes sense to leave it uh, running X. But for the other nodes, it makes absolutely no sense to leave X running and consuming resources. So um, you run the appropriate incantation in system D to switch to what we would have called run level three in the past. Um, you could also set up X forwarding if you have uh, applications that have um, that render a graphical result. Uh, maybe things like uh, Mathematica or a few things like that. But uh, Mathematica can also be used as a computing cluster, so it, it has its own ways to, to deal with such things. Um, in this case, for the sake of simplicity, we're not going to set up X forwarding. Um, most of the expectation here is that you're running NPI code across the nodes, and we're trying to create a, a good environment for hosting this, uh, this NPI code um, as quickly as possible. With the Pike uh, with the Pico cluster, uh, this is particularly cool. Um, uh, Raspberry Pi three or four boards have two interfaces, right? They, there is the wireless interface and there is the wired interface. On Pico cluster, the images come with um, with uh, the wireless disabled, if I remember correctly, and because they expect that the local wiring is the entire source of communication for the cluster. Uh, I like to use both, and so um, uh, the default IP numbering for 
the wired interfaces we leave exactly as it is. And it gives us consistent numbering. And doesn't matter where your cluster is running. It can be in your office. It can be traveling with you. Uh, those interfaces stay with the same name. So uh, they remain operational no matter what network you're on, which is usually not the case for clusters. That is really nice. On the other hand, we set up the Wi-Fi interface to pick up a local um, a lot of Wi-Fi and give us connectivity to download packages or uh, ping the resources on the internet, like updating time, stuff like that. Um, this is very easily done by activating the uh, Wi-Fi interface first so that the proper default routing is put in place by Linux and that you don't have to manually configure the routing tables and you don't have to uh, put those rules in place. It just happens. And then you add a second network, the physical one, afterwards and pick up only the routing that you need for those specific IPs. If you do it in the opposite order, things will not work out well. If you do it in this order, you get exactly what you want. Uh, the other bit that you want to pursue is uh, setting up uh, the Wi-Fi here. You are uh, ready to visit us at Red Hat um, if you want, <laughs> or actually not. Uh, this is uh, our old guest Wi-Fi password, so you need to get a new one if you come to visit us. Um, pretty straightforward, and it's all on the CLI. You just need to know where you're poking. Then uh, we need to generate keys and install them um, on all nodes so that we have transparent SSH access. We have um, the same users. We have the same UIDs, the same passwords, and SSH key authentication throughout. Keys are in place from node 0 to all others with password fallback. And by the way, a little tip, uh, you see um, the SSH import ID command mentioned at the bottom lets you give access to um, uh, GitHub and Launchpad users by name. You simply pass the GitHub username, and it sets up uh, their key for remote access. So it, it gives you a very quick way to, to import uh, people that without having multiple email exchanges, asking them for keys and stuff uh, like that. Uh, gen keys is the, the way you can generate the keys across the cluster uh, out of the, the standard Pico cluster image. These are a pretty standard scripts uh, that the Pico cluster crew has put in um, and they've made available on their GitHub. So I modify them slightly for my cluster and uh, you can do the same for yours, whether you're using uh, their hardware or, and their system images or not. It, it's, um, it's a nice starting point. Uh, one thing that I like to do is um, to move all of the support scripts into a bin directory. Um, this is Raspbian based in the case that I'm using right now. So in, on any Debian derivative, if you create a bin directory in the home, uh, in your home directory, it's already in the path. It's already checked in, uh, it checked for automatically. So you just create the directory. You don't need to do anything else. Okay, uh, obviously Ansible would also be a good way to, uh, to carry the automation across. And we're going to go into that in one sec. So sometimes you just want to carry out um, one-time tasks in, on all nodes. Uh, and here is where parallel SSH comes in. And here is showing with a little bit of example. Um, in the first example, uh, the current user is going to all servers specified in the nodes file and checking the list of host names configured statically. Um, the third example checks connectivity by running ping uh, on those nodes. The difference between the first and the second is that inline option. Um, without the inline, the parallel SSH command by default shows you only output uh, result codes. So it says success or, or fail for every node. If you specify inline, it actually gives you the output. So in the second option, we're actually going to see what is in these uh, etc hosts files. When the first one, we'll just see success, 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 meaning that the files exist. And the third one is a connectivity test. It checks if uh, the nodes can con contact the, the uh, node zero, the primary. The 
fourth test is a DNS check, is when you have network, you don't necessarily have name resolution. So that will try to ping once um, uh, MIT, uh, MIT is a web server, and, um, and we'll see if it succeeds or not uh, in resolving the name. Uh, the last one is kind of a cute example. Uh, there is uh, there is a way to uh, get the temperature readings out of the Pi board um, so that you can check if the cluster is overheating or not. If, uh, if we had gone into the hardware part of this discussion, you would have seen that there are some things that we can do, like replacing the fans so that the cluster is a little bit uh, uh, less noisy uh, when it sits on your desk. And so when you're doing that, you also want to make sure that the replacement fan is effective enough and temperature is not shooting up out, out of uh, what you want as your, your range. Then uh, we're getting pretty, um, uh, pretty reasonable environment, but there are a few things that you want still. Uh, for SSL and uh, generally secure connections, time needs to be correct. Otherwise, um, you get uh, pretty interesting errors when SSL connections fail because time is off. Um, in Kubernetes, it used to hang silently and not tell you anything. I hope that has changed since the last time I did this. But in general, uh, not having a good time source produces errors that are hard to debug because the error messages don't give you anything useful. Um, so don't go there. Just to set it up to begin with. It's pretty simple. And here are the two things that you need to do to, to get a time source in place uh, under system D. The other thing that you need to do is having a shared NFS folder or in some way shared folder across uh, the nodes so that the code that you compiled or that you uploaded to the first node is visible to all nodes. So here we create um, a folder in the first node. We um, will then have it mounted by all nodes uh, so that when we launch the parallel MPI code, uh, with the command execution on the first node, it can also go to all other nodes and find the binary there um, locally. This uh, is pretty uh, straightforward uh, change of the exports file. Nothing too surprising there. Uh, the mounts file is more interesting because um, if you um, if you uh, mess up the etc fs tab like the old Unix graybeards will know your system will not boot. So you want to get uh, the right spacing between those, um, between those um, uh, parameters. So forget the tab, then um, you'll discover how to, how to repair a system with a bad F FS tab. It's not too bad, but it will take you 20 minutes to do it after a little bit of Googling. And the fact that you're doing it on an SD card makes it all the more fun. Once you have that, you pretty much have your, uh, your supercomputer ready. Um, I was mentioning the fact that uh, what's the point of having a supercomputer if you don't have lights to blink? So if you have the Pi Moroni blinked add-on boards, which are basically additional uh, arrays of LEDs that stick uh, to the, uh, the Pi, um, uh, I forget what the option connector of the Pi is officially called. Um, well, you know what I'm talking about. The um, the pinout um, that uh, that gives you access to um, to a um, I/O on the Pi that is used to drive these LEDs. And uh, on the software side, there is a uh, Python uh, set of scripts that you can use to um, light up these LEDs. And these are R RGB LEDs, so you can set them from uh, green to red, and uh, that's ideal for status. So you can pipe the output of top there and basically see how loaded the CPU is. Uh, you, can get, uh, you can get cute and run a, a Cylon or a Larsen scanner, as it's properly called. So you can see a red LED light going left to right. And um, sometimes these things get jammed. So I wrote a little script to save you from seizure uh, if uh, if those th things just don't stop blinking when you call them through the through the parallel SSH command. 
Um, and yeah, the, um, there is a good example there. The CPU load will, will show the output of top, and you can run stress to generate some load and see the red bar rise as the, the system gets busier. Now, that's the first part. The second part we're not going to do, like I said. Um, that is, um, uh, there should be a recording on YouTube of uh, me presenting that um, a couple of times last summer. So um, if you're interested in the MPI tutorial, we're going to, uh, I'm going to refer you to that. And um, I'm just going to go to the end slide here, which is the various links for the uh, the resources that I have used are on there on the left. The Pico cluster, various scripts, and the additional tools. One thing that I use heavily in the second part is Mathematica, not because of the parallel part, but because it's very easy to analyze um, uh, performance data based on that. Uh, and it, Mathematica is free for Raspberry Pi, so that's a very nice gift of uh, Wolfram to students. And I think we're one minute past Mark, and we're done. Thank you very much. Um, that was a very interesting talk. Um, if you send us the slide file, we'll put it up on the sysadmin.miniconf.org site. Mm -hmm. and people will be able to um, have a look through the rest of the slides that we didn't have time for now. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, it was thank great you. that you were able to give it. Um, we now have a 10-minute break before the next speaker, um, Derhans, is going to speak to us. So see you in 10 minutes.